Gracious Father, you are a God who has provided more for your people than any of us could ever ask or even think. But we are a people prone to ask wrongly. We have a strong desire to consume things for our own lust. We're so easily confused. We confuse our wants and our needs. We ask you for what we want instead of asking you to give us what we need. Yet you still invite us to this feast. And we still find a table. And that table is spread with everything that we need. That causes us to humbly wonder, of all people, why did you choose me to be a guest at your table? Why was I made to hear your voice? Why was I made to join this feast? While so many around us have made a damning choice and would rather starve perishing in their sin. So we humbly thank you, Father, that you sweetly drew us in. We acknowledge that if you had not, we would have refused to taste at this feast, and we also would have perished in our sin. So now our prayer is that you'd send your conquering word abroad, that you'd open our eyes to see our need for the soul food that you'll provide in these moments. Help us in our hearing. Make us understand what we hear. Convict us of sin and give us victory over it. Strengthen the weary. Caution the self-confident. Stop our self-gratifying efforts and grow our faith. This morning, bring the stranger home. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our text today is Colossians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. If you took the time this week to read this text, you may have wondered, why are we stopping at verse 14? As you read it, you may have sensed the natural build here, the ramping up towards something big, something monumental. Kind of like when you're, you're flying into New York City and you're looking for something. The Statue of Liberty. Today, we're interrupting the flight, stopping just short of the towering monument of Colossians 1. But I pray this will help us today in our understanding. Have you ever said something to someone and you wanted it to feel meaningful, but for whatever reason, when you said it, it felt small, insignificant, or like it offered little to no help at all? Maybe you said, well, I hope things get better. I love you. But as you said it, you thought, I don't know what good that did for them, for someone that's weeping over loss. Maybe you said, I'm praying for you, and wondered, what strength will those words give them as they battle this chronic illness? With hands chained to the floor of his stone cell, I hardly think Paul felt that he was offering up an empty expression, simple pleasantries, or just another word of affection toward this church. He's not minimizing the situation that the Colossians are in. He's not trivializing their circumstances by saying, hey, I'll pray for you. Paul's prayer is not empty. Rather, it's weighty. It's filled with intentionality, filled with deep theology and purpose. Paul's actually never been to Colossae, but he is certain that his prayers have been there. You realize this morning that your prayers can go where you can't. You can even pray like Paul for people that you've never met. But why is Paul praying for them? Paul and his companions sat in chains. Then certainly they received word that a guest had arrived. Their guest was named Epaphras from Colossae. Now it's likely that he and Paul knew one another from Paul's time in Ephesus, which may be the place where Epaphras was converted. I'm sure they greeted one another upon arrival, not just with a handshake because brothers got a hug, and then they followed it up, I'm sure, with a holy kiss. But Epaphras came not just to greet Paul, he came with a purpose and with a message. His message, Paul, 
I'm here to tell you of the danger that's looming in Colossae. Some pretty weird teaching is going on. People are saying that there's a, a deeper Christian experience, one that goes beyond the knowledge that's from God, and it can only be reached by a mixture of philosophy with spiritual powers and some human tradition. Now, if that's all that Epaphras had said, it would have been enough to drive Paul to prayer for the Colossian church. But in our text, we find another launching point for Paul's prayer. Epaphras' report to Paul contained more than a concern for his people. He also included with that a report that guided Paul's prayer for this church. The same report that we'll look at today should serve to direct us and to motivate us in our prayers today. Paul observes the lives of the Colossian Christians through the report that he hears, and then what he observed drove him to prayer. We will examine his prayer in these two divisions. First, giving thanks for God's active grace in Colossae, in verses 3 through 8. Secondly, making request for God's continued grace in Colossae. Giving thanks for God's active grace in Colossae, verses 3 through 8. And making requests for God's continued grace in Colossae, verses 9 through 14. We begin in verse 3. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world, and it's bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. Just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. Epaphras reports, Paul observes through listening, then Paul responds by giving thanks for God's act of grace in Colossae. Note the frequency of his thanksgiving in verse 3. Always, every time we pray, every time they exercise their prayer muscles, they thanked God for the Colossians. Paul and his companions exercised their prayer muscles often, but they didn't just pray for them once and then move along. Paul sets a reminder on his prison wall calendar to pray for the church at Colossae. He prays for them often. Church, please know as we walk through these verses that your pastors pray for you. Your pastors pray for you. Let's note the object of his gratitude. The object of his gratitude is not the Colossian Christians. It's not their winning streak of good choices. It's not their pastor, maybe Epaphras, in his well-crafted words. No, it's God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. His gratitude is directed toward the Father because God is the author of the work that Paul is observing in the lives of the people. There are so many things we can learn from Paul's prayer of gratitude here. Jonathan Edwards helps us in this through a distinction that he makes between natural gratitude and gracious gratitude. Natural gratitude, as he explains, starts with the things that we are given. The stuff. It starts with the benefits which accrue to us. Anyone can be grateful for stuff. But gracious gratitude, it differs from natural gratitude because it starts with God himself. Gracious gratitude recognizes the character of God, the goodness of God, the love, the power, the excellencies of God himself, regardless of the stuff, regardless of favors or enjoyments. This is how Paul makes his thanksgiving to God, with a gratitude that's in response to God's grace in other people's lives. We're so, so quick to thank God for stuff, for things we like, 
for the relationships we enjoy, for the pleasures of life. Which leads us to consider how do we start our prayer of thanksgiving? When you give thanks to, you God, to God, how do you begin? Father, thank you for my house. Thank you for my family, the sunshine, my job, my food. What we thank God for in prayer is a direct reflection of what we value most. What you and I thank God for in prayer reveals what we truly value. May God help us in our giving of thanks to give thanks and prize the character, the goodness, the love, the power, and the excellencies of God above all other enjoyments that God provides. Now, don't miss this. You can and should thank God for the enjoyments in life. He has graced you with those. But your gratitude and your affection should always be for the giver, not primarily for the gift. Yes. Gratitude primarily towards the giver and then the gift that he has given. This is just what Paul does. He recognizes the maker as the giver the author of all things good. And instead of thanking God the Father for health, for the things that are going right in his life, I'm sure he could have found a couple of things, maybe good weather, maybe his friend that's visiting. But he thanks God when he prays. And he prays and thanks God for this church. In verses 4 through 5a, Paul thanks God for divine evidence of new life. He observes divine evidence of new life. Verse 4, Paul says, Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. Now remember, Paul is observing upon hearing a spoken report. And now he is relaying in this writing to the church his observations concerning them. These evidences that he lists are observed in the Colossian Christians. And they should be observed in us today. All that he observes in this church should be observed in us. First, he observed their faith in Christ Jesus. Now, Paul isn't saying, I've heard that you've acknowledged a few facts. I've, I've heard that you've checked the right boxes. No, when he speaks of their faith, he means so much more than just mental assent to truth. So much more than that. He means a faith that acts. On what it believes. An active faith. We hear statements like. You got to have faith. But that's another statement. That can feel empty. If the object of faith isn't made clear. Faith. Has little to no worth. When it is alone. Ask James. Faith in a silo. Doesn't mean a whole lot. Faith must draw its value. From its object. The text tells us that the Colossians were a people known for their faith in Jesus Christ. Paul could just as well have said, we've heard of your faithfulness to Jesus Christ. What a glowing start to Epaphras' report. The Colossians, known for their faith in Christ Jesus. Verse 4. Since we heard of the love that you have for all, all the saints. Their faithfulness in Christ isn't traveling alone. It's accompanied by devotion to others. They're known for something else, for the love they have for all God's people. In their faithfulness to Christ, they're seeking to better the welfare of others. And for Paul, this is a sure sign that God's grace is at work. This is a sure sign because their love is not restricted by natural affinity. It's not restricted by nationality, by a family name, by interest, by status, by rank. None of these things were prerequisites in order to be loved at the church in Colossae. Their love extended to all the saints. And Paul was sure to thank God for it. To thank God for this love, this divine evidence of new life. Paul has thanked God now, who authored their faith in Christ, who was the author of their love for all the saints, 
And lastly, in this triad, he thanks the Father because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Now, if this morning we just took to the task of arranging these three words, hope, love, and faith, without looking at our passage, most of us would have ordered them faith, hope, and then love. That's because most often our minds go to Paul's writings to Corinth. But here in Colossians, he orders them faith, love, and hope. Why is it that he does this? The hope that Paul speaks of has little to do with your personal dreams coming true. That is not what he had in mind. But it does have a whole lot to do with God fulfilling his promises. The promises he's made to you and to his people. So here's a little snapshot of this hope that they had. Christ promised that he would be resurrected. And Christ has promised that I'll be resurrected. Since he fulfilled that promise, the first one, and he is resurrected, then I know he will fulfill his promise to resurrect me. But why does he mention hope last in this triad? He mentions hope last because it is this hope that gives rise to their faith and gives rise to their love. Faith and love are grounded in their hope. So their daily experience then of faith and love rests on the concrete foundation of what God has promised to do for them in the future. Consider what a testament of God's grace at work in Colossae this is as Paul rehearses this to them. Here are the Colossians. They're faced with teaching that led them to wonder whether or not Christ was enough. The question was this. Can Christ really supply everything? Can he really supply all of our spiritual needs? These questions are pulling at them. The people, while being pulled, are continuing in faithfulness to Christ. They're continuing in love for all the saints. Why? Because their faith and love are resting on what God has promised to do for them. The Colossians receive this encouragement from Paul as he says, What in its fullness lies in front of you has already become active in you. God has begun a good work in you and he guarantees you that he'll complete it on that day. So the triad of faith, love, and hope are evidence of God's work in their lives. How, though, have they obtained this hope? In Ephesians, we're reminded that without Christ... We were lost and we were without hope. Death, you could say, served as the great hope killer. We needed a savior king who could overcome that hope killer. And today we stand assuredly and say Christ is the savior king who defeated death. Christ killed the hope killer. So today, you and I can have confident hope just as the church at Colossae could. In a world where hope goes to die, or hopes go to die, our hope as Christians is alive, fueling our faith and love. Our hope is real because it's inseparably fixed on the real thing, the resurrected Christ. Our hope is alive, and our hope is fueling or generating our faith and love. Our hope is real because it's fixed on the real thing the resurrected Christ. Our steadfast hope should be evident. Evident in what? It should be evident in our active faith and in our active love. Like the Colossians, we should be living a life that is future-aimed, or as J.I. Packer called it, the forward-tilting life. That is what the gospel does. It transforms us and it reorients us toward heaven. Hope awakens faith and faith awakens love. So we should, with Paul, give thanks to God for faith, for love, and for hope in the lives of God's people. The divine evidence of new life in Colossae. 
Now Paul gives thanks for the divine increase of gospel fruit. In verses 5b through verse 8, he says, Of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel. What had they heard? They had heard the true message, the truth, the gospel, the word of truth. They heard the true word. This word heard reminds us of God's chosen people. When God spoke, Israel listened. When God spoke in Colossae, Colossae listened. But Paul says in verse 6 that they didn't just hear it. No, they also understood the grace of God and truth. They didn't go on a truth hunt. No, their starting point was the truth that had been spoken to them. When it was spoken to them, they soaked up the hope of this gospel. They acted on this gospel, on the word of truth, by living in obedience to it. The church at Colossae heard and understood the gospel. They heard and understood the good news that Christ died for their sins, according to the scriptures. They heard and understood that Christ was buried and raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. They heard and understood that the resurrected Christ was seen on many occasions and of more than 500 witnesses at once. They heard. The gospel came to them. They heard it. They understood it. Just like it had, as verse 6 tells us, in the whole world. Paul tells the Colossians that the gospel is going Arnold Schwarzenegger on the, war, on the known world. No, not the political figure, the muscle man. The gospel is flexing its muscles. It's exerting its power in many places all around the known world. How is God accomplishing his purpose? He's doing it through his gospel. The whole world here speaks to the global reach of the gospel, to the global power of the gospel. But it also speaks to how effective the gospel is. The gospel seed has been planted in Colossae, but it's sprouted now, and it's sprouting in the whole world around them. It's bringing harvest after harvest after harvest. It's increasing. It's true. And the Colossians are invited to see their own lives as part of the story of the gospel. Today, you and I receive this invitation. We're invited to see our lives as part of the grand story of the gospel. What humility should that bring? You and I are invited to see our lives as part of the grand story of the gospel. The same gospel that bore fruit in Colossae is bearing fruit at FFC. Yes. The same gospel bearing fruit in this passage is the gospel that bears fruit today at FFC. Have you heard and understood the gospel? If you have, do you proclaim it? After all, how had Colossae heard the gospel? Colossae heard the gospel because God proclaimed it to them through the faithful messenger. Verse 7. Just as you learned it from Epaphras. Now again, Epaphras most likely heard and understood the gospel during Paul's ministry at Ephesus. Returning afterwards to proclaim the gospel to those in Colossae, where Paul had never been. Paul describes Epaphras as a beloved fellow servant, a term of affection. Paul and Epaphras are both in the service of Christ Jesus, and this is clearly work for the benefit of the people at Colossae. The result of the word of truth, of the gospel being ministered by God's faithful servant, is that faith in the gospel is exploding. It's exploding because God is the one bringing the increase. We must remember that God has committed himself to working through the proclamation of the gospel. Yes. God has committed himself to working through the proclamation of the gospel. His promise is that his word will not return void. We must proclaim 
his word. So because he's committed himself to working through the proclamation of the gospel, we should proclaim the gospel and we should thank God for the people who brought us the gospel. Proclaim the gospel and thank God for the people that he used to get you that gospel. This is gratitude that starts with God himself. With his goodness made known to us in the gospel. With his excellencies made known as he brings forth fruit in the lives of his people. Paul started by giving thanks for God's act of grace in Colossae. Now we see him making requests for God's continued grace at Colossae. Verse 9. And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you. There are many consistencies in what Paul thanked God for in the verses previous and what he now prays will happen in their lives. His prayer requests, though, in verses 9 through 14, are crafted from the report that he's received from Epaphras. Every detail, every request tailored to the current situation in Colossae. His prayer for them, like his thanksgiving, is continual. He's prayed these things for them from the day that he received the report. Don't trivialize prayer. I encourage you this morning, don't trivialize prayer. Our prayer for others and their prayer for us is a vital component of Christian community. It is a vital component of Christian community. This type of prayer isn't prayer that sits around waiting for a problem. Ask yourself this question. Do I pray reactively or proactively? Honestly, do you pray only reactively or do you pray proactively? Proactive prayer is what Paul is doing for the Colossian Christians. He is both reactive, he's received a report, but he is both not just reactive, but also proactive, praying for what will be in Colossae. He's not asking God to fix something or just to fix something that's broken. No, he's asking God to strengthen those who belong to God. He's doing preventative maintenance in prayer. In verses 9 through 12, we find out what his requests were. First, that they may be filled with the knowledge of his will. Filled with the knowledge of his will. Not like those who, who have no interest in the knowledge of God and therefore neglect the scriptures. Not like those who bypass knowledge and are looking for some experience. Not like those who... They like knowledge, but they neglect the implications of that knowledge. Paul knows that a true knowledge should always inform our way of life. So he prays that they would be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. He wants their knowledge to be tied to practical Christian living. He doesn't want them to be puffed up with knowledge, but to be informed by it. Knowledge of God's will always carries practical implications. It is essential for proper living. It makes us bring our lives in line with it. So what does it mean to know God's will? To know God's will is to know God's character. To know God's will is to know his word. The better you know God's word, the better you understand his will. Paul's prayer is for a knowledge, for, for a wisdom, an understanding that will lead them into maturity in Christ. He wants their sound thinking to lead to sound living. Sound thinking leading to sound living. And what would the result of this type of living be? Paul tells us, verse 10, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. Worthy 
of the Lord. This is not about merit or living a life that somehow makes me be worthy of Christ. No, it's about reflecting our Lord, reflecting his worth, and reflecting the value of his gospel. So the goal then in our practical living is to walk in a way that shows the worth of our Lord. Then we have this phrase, fully pleasing to him. Fully pleasing to him. Those who belong to Christ can and do please God. Those who belong to Christ can and do please God. They live in a way that reflects Christ's worth. Does your life reflect the worth, the value of Christ? That's why Paul asks the Colossians, asks that the Colossians may be filled with the knowledge of God's will so that they'll live in a way that reflects the worth of Christ. And in doing so, their lives would please God. But how can we live in a way that pleases God? What does that look like? Verse 10b, he prays that they'll do this by bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Now, remember, we've already seen that knowledge is a poor solo pilot. It has to be accompanied by fruit. Yes. The goal is never just knowledge. The goal is knowing God more deeply. And what, the, what that looks like is we get to know God more, and God gets bigger in our understanding. Every time we read the word, God gets bigger in our understanding. Every time we hear the word preached, God gets bigger in our understanding. Then that knowing God more deeply leads to action, to a fruitful life. One in, in which the way we live pleases our Father. So hear Paul's prayer. He's praying for behavior that matches belief. For conduct that matches confession. This is pleasing to God. Paul understood here God's new creation in Christ, here in Colossians, to be fulfilling the mandate that was made to the first Adam. That mandate, that command was to bear fruit and multiply. All those who place their faith in Christ are a part of this new creation in Christ. And Paul says they are bearing fruit. This is the new creation that God looks on and declares it to be good. It's pleasing to him. In verse 11, he expounds on how they live this pleasing to God life. Strengthened with all power for joyful patience and endurance. This is a reminder that God commands and God gives. God gives for what God commands. Paul prays that the power of the sovereign creator of the universe would be unleashed in their lives and would fuel them on to endurance and to patience. And this portion of Paul's prayer reminds us of something. It reminds us that growth in the knowledge of God is an uphill battle. Holiness is an uphill battle. And that strength for that battle can only come from the power of God himself. We have this command, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. A believer with endurance and patience, you might say uh, perseverance in circumstances and patience in relationships, is one who is walking worthy of the Lord. This is a way we walk worthy. How does the church walk worthy? A church with endurance and patience is a great church. Because it is a church that pleases the Lord. Paul keeps praying. And he keeps praying that they'll please the Lord in other ways. Now, he's praying that they'll please the Lord as they give thanks to the Father. Now, there are times that gratitude can be a difficult discipline. But a true understanding of God's grace will always lead you to gratitude. On the flip side, consuming greed and ingratitude 
are sure signs that you have never understood the grace of God? Do you have a continual spirit of ingratitude, of consuming greed? Have you understood the grace of God? Gratitude is the theme song of Christians, and it pleases God when we sing those praises. If you've received God's grace, you respond in gratitude. It would do us a lot of good today to see grace and thanksgiving as two sides of the same coin. Grace and thanksgiving. One must accompany the other. God is gracious to us. We are thankful to God. Now, don't hear this as a call to be more grateful. No, hear this as a call to grow in the knowledge of the grace of God and then to respond to that grace in gratitude. Paul's prayer is that the Colossians will grow in gratitude, not just for things, but for God's continued activity in their lives. And remember, as we said earlier, what we thank God for in prayer is a direct reflection of what we value most. So Paul is showing what he values. He values what the gospel has achieved in their lives. So he tells them what to give thanks for. He thanks God for what the gospel has achieved in their lives. Church, let's take a moment right now with Paul to thank God for what the gospel has achieved in our lives. This looks to be an, an early confession of faith within the early church. So Paul thanks God that they, the brethren, the church at Colossae, are qualified for an eternal inheritance. Verse 12, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. We are qualified for an eternal inheritance. The blessings of our final redemption have already broken through into the present. They've not come to this, the Colossians, automatically. No, God made them fit for it. Qualifies. See, Paul knows that no one is worthy, that no one is qualified. But by an act of God's grace, he has made us fit for this inheritance. He made the church at Colossae fit. He makes us fit today for this inheritance. FFC, by grace, we stand as shareholders of an incorruptible inheritance. The blessings of that inheritance are already being poured on us. Amen. We're seeing it in Colossae. That is true for us today. We have an incorruptible inheritance. We're qualified for this eternal inheritance. And then he goes on and he says, we're delivered from the domain of darkness. FFC, we have been delivered from the domain of darkness. The domain of darkness is, is like Lewis's fictional land of Narnia, where it was always winter, but it was never Christmas. Where evil ruled, where wickedness thrived. The domain of darkness is everything that captures the world, that binds it, and that attempts to strike down God's rescue plan. Now, it's possible that the Colossians were being told that they, as a church, were still prisoners to the domain of darkness, but that they needed something other than Christ to fully deliver them. Paul says, no. No! Evil may have had its short moment of opportunity against Christ, but it was only a short moment, and it ended in evil's defeat. Christ raided the kingdom of darkness, and he's rescued those who were bound by sin's chains. If you're here today and you have not repented of your sin, you are still under the domain of darkness. And know this. You have to know this this morning. The prince of darkness is a harsh ruler. If you have not heard and understood the gospel, then you have not been rescued from the domain of darkness. You have not been rescued 
we would say from the judgment of God. The prince of darkness cannot save you from the wrath of God. So today, believe on Christ and exchange the harsh rule of darkness for the wise sovereignty of God's Son. He continues his statement. He says that they have been transferred into the kingdom of the Son he loves. FFC, we have been transferred into the kingdom of God under the sovereign rule of King Jesus. The kingdom of God is our established reality today. And we, the redeemed, live in fellowship together under our king's rule. If you're not living under his rule, I'd have to ask you, what kingdom are you living in? Verse 14, Paul says that in God's beloved son, we have redemption. Redemption in Christ. FFC, we have been bought with a price. We are redeemed. The ransom price has been paid. Our debt was paid as we sang together by Jesus' death. Imprisoned by the prince of darkness, but now set free by the blood of Christ. This is true rescue. This is ultimate and complete rescue. Verse 14. In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Redemption in Christ, forgiveness in Christ. FFC, we have been forgiven. Now, this is essential for you and I to understand. We have to grasp this truth if we will live a life that is worthy of the Lord. Often, when we think of living a life worthy of the Lord... When we think of a life that's pleasing to him, we think, how could I ever live a life that's pleasing to God? I want to live for Jesus, but I feel like I just can't. I'm too defeated by my own sinfulness. The prince of darkness loves nothing more than to hurl your sin struggles in your face. The hymn writer, Charity Bancroft, said it well in the second stanza of Before the Throne of God Above. She said this, When Satan, the prince of darkness, tempts me to despair, when he tells me of the guilt within, how do I respond? Upward I look and see him there who made an end of all my sins. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on Christ and to pardon me. Turn your gaze to the sinless Savior who made an end of all your sin. The forgiveness of sins opens up the possibility for us to live a life that is worthy of our Lord. To live a life that is pleasing to God. The forgiveness of sins opens up the possibility of living a life pleasing to God. And we've walked verse by verse through this portion of Paul's prayer. This prayer crafted for the church at Colossae. We saw him giving thanks to God for, his, for God's grace at work in Colossae. We know that the gospel was proclaimed and that the gospel bore fruit. We also saw, saw him making requests for God's continued grace to work there at Colossae. That they would be filled with the knowledge of God's will in order to please God with their lives. These words are words that God has given you to pray for your church family. Pray these words for your spouse. Pray these words for your children, and please pray these words for your pastors. If you're praying these scriptures for us, you'll never pray the wrong thing. So as we pray for one another, may there be riches behind those words praying for you. May, they be, may there be great depth behind the words 
praying for you. Father, what grace, what love, what life, what gift that you poured upon us that we should be called your children. Oh, that our lips would praise you constantly, forever, and from the abundance of our hearts. Make our praise swell into prayer, that the eternal riches of God's grace would be magnified, that the name of Christ would ever be on our tongues, proclaiming that Christ in us rules, that Christ in us reigns, and that Christ in us leads us to the hope of eternal glory. By your blood, you've redeemed us. We are never to be lost. We're forgiven. So may your gospel now be heard. May it be understood everywhere that it's proclaimed. Free the captive. Give sight to the blind. And bring those who are bound by sin out of their darkness. May we, the children of light, ever sing the joyful song of celebration of gratitude to our gracious Redeemer, our gracious Savior, and our gracious King. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.